turn in your Bibles to Judges 19. We will be cranking through the next three chapters because it kind of all flows together. So um, if I mess up on words, it's okay. It's the learning disability kicking in. Nothing wrong with your translation. (laughs) Judges 19. And this is the, the final piece of the history covered in the book of Judges. And as we said this morning, it's truly tragic. A uh, very dark period in the nation of Israel. And um, as you see throughout the Bible, God just shows it and tells it like it is. He doesn't hold it back. These are some of the things that if you're a translation, hey, let's keep this story out because it's very graphic and very tragic. Uh, but again, God tells it like it is. And he knows uh, what's going on inside of our hearts. And in time, that will overflow into actions. And uh, if our hearts are wicked, so too will our actions. And that's what we've seen throughout the book of Judges. The climax of Israel's moral depravity is being exposed uh, through a litany of really unspeakable um, sins. As we mentioned time and time again, how everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. In chapter 17 and 18, as we saw last week, we saw the religious idolatry. We see that led to the confusion and chaos and apostasy and the, the, all that was taking place during Israel at that time. In chapter 19 through 21... It's going to be dealing with some social um, vileness that takes place during this period of time. And as we mentioned uh, last time, the last five chapters of the book of Judges is really kind of an appendix uh, to the book, giving us kind of an inside um, look of the spiritual, social, moral conditions of the people. And uh, in tonight's story, in chapters 19 through 21, uh, like last week, we think takes place in the beginning part of the book of Judges, not at the very end. Um, That's uh, kind of how they've kind of put some time frames uh, within this. Uh, But some of the stuff that we're about to see here, uh, and one of the reasons of telling this particular story is because it sets the stage uh, for the first king of Israel, as you know, is King Saul, uh, who was from the tribe of Benjamin. So all that's going to play into what we're going to be covering tonight. We have a lot of ground to cover. We're going to read big chunks at a time. Uh, it's all narrative, so it kind of flows quite well. Uh, and again, as uh, and just to kind of give you a word of warning, uh, some of the stuff that we're about to read can be difficult and confronting. Um, it's uh, you know we'll just dive in. Let's go for it. Verse one, chapter nineteen. In those days, Israel had no king. Now a Levite who lived in the remote area of the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine from Bethlehem and in Judea. So again, we see the problem introduced to us again. There was no king in Israel. And again, God was to be their king. And uh, they removed him from the throne of their hearts and their lives. And, and they're now they're guided by their fleshly desires. And, uh, and we see this Levite here uh, who wants to do whatever he wants to do. He wants to satisfy him flat, his flesh. And understand a concubine really is nothing more than kind of a second-class wife at this time. She would provide the companionship and uh, take care of his needs, uh, yet she didn't have the same uh, blessings or benefits of a, uh, of a wife would have. Uh, the practice, though, of taking a concubine uh, was allowable in the Old Testament. You see case after case of it. Uh, it wasn't ordained and it wasn't approved by the Lord. And yet, because people are already regularly practicing it, there are some regulations that the Old Testament uh, puts in there. And, uh, but as you move through the redemptive history of God's people, uh, you see that it makes it very clear that this is not God's plan, nor is it his will. And of all people, as you read here with this Levite, uh, ought not to have been involved in this practice. Verse 2 goes on to say, But she was unfaithful to him. She left him, went back to her parents' home in Bethlehem, Judea. After she had been there four months, her husband went to her to persuade her to return. He had with him his servant and two donkeys, and she took him into her parents' home, where her father saw him and gladly welcomed him. So no wonder why the concubine's father uh, rejoiced to meet the Levite, because here is this religious man who is a priest and from the tribe of the priest, who evidently was willing to perhaps try to tame his wild and flirtatious daughter. 
And so you kind of get a glimpse of his heart here that he's seeking her out after four months, really, uh, trying to persuade her, speak kindly to her to uh, come back after she's played the harlot for him. And so the father here, he's glad to meet his son-in-law, and they hit it off. Notice verse 4 goes on to say, So his father-in-law, the woman's father, prevailed on him and uh, to stay. So he remained there three days, eating and drinking and sleeping. On the fourth day, he got up early and prepared to leave, and the woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh yourself with something to eat, then you can go. And the two of them sat down to eat and drink together. And afterwards, the woman's father says, please stay the night and enjoy yourself. And then the man got up to go and the father-in-law persuaded him to stay there the night. On the morning of the fifth day, when he rose to go, the woman's father says, refresh yourself, wait till afternoon. So the two of them ate together. And when the man uh, with his concubine and his servant got up to leave, the father-in-law, the woman's father said, now look, it's almost evening. Uh, stay the night here. The day's almost over. Stay and enjoy yourself. Early tomorrow morning, you can get up and be on your way. But unwilling to stay another night, the man left, went toward Jebus, that is Jerusalem, with his two saddled donkeys and his concubine. And when they were near Jebus, uh, the day was almost gone. The servant said to his master, come, let us stop in the city of the Jebusites and spend the night. So again, you see here multiple times because of the hospitality, he's delaying uh, his departure. But now on the fifth day, uh, he doesn't stay the night. Um, so he's planning on leaving in the afternoon. He knows he's not going to make it home by night. And this was not the wisest decision, as we'll see. Uh, and it was dangerous traveling in Israel at that time, especially at night as a man and woman. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, danger that happens during that time. Now, the town of Jebus or Jerusalem is about 12 kilometers, maybe 25 miles, depends on how you want to do your calculations there, uh, from Bethlehem to Judea. So it's, it's not a long journey, but it is you know, some time if it's late in the afternoon when they get going. And again, keep in mind, in Judges chapter 1, verse 21, we're told that the tribe of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites. And so thus they held the city, they grew stronger in driving out the children of Israel. So it became a stronghold there. Verse 12 goes on, and so his master replied, no, we won't go into the, any cities whose people are not Israelites. We will go to Gibeah. And he added, come, let us try to reach Gibeah or Ramah uh, and spend the night in one of those places. And so they went on, and the sun set, and as they near Gibeah in Benjamin. There they stopped to spend the night and sat in the city square, but no one took them in for the night. So the Levite chose not to stay in a pagan city uh, of Jerusalem at the time what was happening. Um, and instead of, uh, they went on to Gibeah, which belonged to the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, Ramah, which was another potential town they could have stayed in. Uh, this is kind of in the northern suburbs of uh, Jebus or Jerusalem. Uh, so those were one of the two options, but they end up going to Gibeah instead. And... Um, this Israelite town kind of seems safe place to lodge, at least at first, but something's drastically wrong. Uh, you won't know this unless you actually understand the culture and what was happening there. As that last sentence, no one took them in for the night. So God's law and direction uh, to God's people had been one of showing hospitality. So we might draw a couple conclusions from this particular sentence here. One is that there is no respect for the law or God's direction, which is a, a huge uh, indication right here. Uh, it might have been an offense to everyone in the community uh, for someone to stay in the square, but this offense wasn't just for one or two people. The entire town is guilty of this. They have this person that uh, anyone could have taken in uh, for their home for the night. It is possible that uh, lawlessness had become so bad they feared taking in a stranger, much like it is today. You're not going to just pick a homeless person up and bring them to your home. You know, uh, We're uncomfortable with that. Even with people that you do know, it's sometimes uncomfortable, right? And so all this fear and this mistrust is all born because of sin. Uh, that's happened within cultures. You know, we, we lack trust and there's you never know what's going to happen uh, in those situations. So the effect of sin and lawlessness within their culture, within our culture. Now, verse 16 goes on with the story. 
That evening, an old man from the hill country of Ephraim, who was living in, the, in Gibeah, the inhabitants of the place where the Benjamites came from, uh, his work uh, in the fields. And they looked and saw the traveler in the city square. The old man said, or asked, where are you going? Where did you come from? And he answers, uh, we're on our way to Bethlehem in Judea from Bethlehem, Judea, to a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim, where I live. I have been in Bethlehem in Judea, and now I'm going to the house of the Lord. No one has taken me in for the night. We have both straw and fodder, which is kind of feed or grain for our donkeys, and bread and wine for ourselves, your servants, me and the woman and the young man with us. We don't need anything. You're welcome to stay at my house, the old man says. Let me supply whatever you need. Only don't spend the night in the square. So here we're introduced to this old man. Don't know his name, but he's from Ephraim, and he's the only one that shows interest in uh, showing toward hospitality toward the Levite, the concubine, and his servant. And uh, so those around there, the native to the land, disregard the Levite, you know. And, uh, and we also take note that the Levite said that he's on his way to the house of the Lord. So that's not something that everyone just says, you know, but here's a Levite, you know, so there's some uh, credibility because he is uh, a, a priest. And so, and the house of the Lord is in Shiloh at this time. And so he felt that he had all that he needed, wasn't going to be trouble to the old man, as you see with his, uh, what he's got with him. And, and the real irony is the wording of the invitation, you know, besides the hint that it might not be safe in the square. You know, this is something maybe the Levite didn't understand at the time. Anyways, verse 21 goes on to say, He took him into his house, fed his donkeys. After that, he had washed their feet, had something to eat and drink. While they're enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house. Pounding on the door, they shouted to bring the old man who owned the house. Bring out the man to come to your house that so we may have sex with him. Now, it kind of reminds you of what took place in Sodom and Gomorrah. How God sent two angels in, uh, as men uh, to destroy the city. And, and so when the men received uh, by lot into the house, the men of Sodom uh, that evening circled the house. They demanded lot to send these two guys outside that they might have homosexual relations with them. And as you know, how God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sin. And uh, the same thing is happening here. Only it's an Israelite city amongst the tribe of Benjamin. The same wicked sin that committed the destruction in Sodom is now happening among God's people. So the moral decay into the nation had sunk obvious, uh, and it's really evident within this story here. And as the homosexuals of the city are so brazenly, openly parading themselves in the streets in the city, demanding their rights, uh, which are not rights at all, much like what we see today with the whole LGBTQ plus uh, community and their um, influence and their agenda. You know, this is kind of what you're seeing taking place. So the old man, he recognized this wickedness, uh, as you see in the next verse. The owner of the house went outside and said to them, no, my friends. Do not be so vile. Since this man is my guest, don't do this outrageous thing. Look, here's my virgin daughter and his concubine. I'll bring them out to you now, and you can use them and do to them whatever you wish. But as for this man, don't touch, do such an outrageous thing. Now, most fathers would rather give their own lives than their children or their daughters uh, in, this, in this case. So this is where it's shocking, right? And uh, perhaps he had that case of, I'm going to fear for my own life and uh, I'll do anything to save it, thinking that the homosexuals, uh, if we offer them girls instead, uh, it's going to save everyone's life. They wouldn't want, know what to do with that which is normal. And as sinful as this offer is, but it's another one of the many examples of the book about people doing whatever they felt like without considering the consequences of it. The point here is that these two women were offered uh, to this gang instead of the young man. Now, one has to grasp the custom of protecting uh, the male house guests. Uh, is such a strong custom as to offer the women instead of a sign uh, of how much it meant. And so maybe they're thinking that if the homosexual rape gang grasps the seriousness of this custom, they might back off and just kind of, oh, whatever, you know, we'll just leave. 
Uh, and of course, the drive to do evil is so strong uh, that they eventually accept the offer here. Now, because of the custom and the, uh, of the hospitality and because women in that culture uh, and time had very little rights, uh, this man did something that for us is unthinkable. Uh, he offers his virgin daughter and the man's concubine. But this really shows you the depravity of what's going on at that time in the society who's left God out. It reminds us of Romans chapter 1, uh, how people have turned from God, uh, turned to a debased mind, uh, to turn that which is, uh, you know, from natural. And you see how far these people have gone. Well, verse 25 goes on to say, But the men would not listen to him, so the man took his concubine, sent her outside to them, and they raped her and abused her throughout the night. And uh, at dawn they let her go. And at daybreak the woman went back to the house where her master was staying, fell down at the door, and lay there until daylight. So I warned you, it's a tough chapter, you know, and, and it doesn't get any easier. So here we read this gang of homosexuals raping, mistreating the concubine all night long. And in fact, the Levite, you know, took the cock, you know, offered them to him. So you see sin in so many levels here. And it's curious why he had even traveled so far, or not even that far, but to, to fetch this girl, to spend a week partying with her and her father, uh, and at any sign of trouble, out you go. So the sad part is, yes, this uh, gang raped her probably over and over until she ended up dying at the doorstep of the house here. Uh, so many things wrong with this picture. Well, let's go on to say in verse 27, So when her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to uh, continue his way, there laid his concubine, fallen at the door of the house with her hands on the uh, threshold, and said to her, Get up. Let's go. But there was no answer. And so the man put her on his donkey and set her out for home. So you see, there's no compassion here whatsoever from this guy. I don't even think he even cared about her. He just wanted her back to pay, perhaps maybe enlarge his family. But obviously the fact that he sacrificed her to a bunch of hoodlums is a sign he really didn't care for her any, anyway. Uh, and the text implies uh, the fact that she died there, but it doesn't blatantly say it. Uh, and amongst all the horror here is the fact that, um, uh, you know, I forgot to mention that this becomes, this all took place in uh, Benjamin territory. So we're going to come back to this because uh, that's a, an essential part of the story as well. Now, as you know, many of you uh, know that Israel's territory is divided into 12 sections, uh, uh, one for each of the tribes, and uh, that becomes more significant as we get into the next chapter. Uh, personally, I just have a hard time getting over the horror of all this, you know. Um, and just when you think the story can't get any stranger or gross, it does. Verse 29 goes on to say, when he reached home, he took the knife and cut up his concubine limb by limb into 12 parts and sent them into the house of the areas of Israel. Everyone who saw it was saying to one another, such a thing has never been done or seen, uh, not since the day the Israelites came up out of Egypt. Just imagine, we must do something, so speak up. So like we said, either she died at the, uh, the, the doorstep or maybe she died traveling back home where they lived, we don't know. Um, but... The crazy thing is, I mean, how do you divide a body up into 12 parts? You know, I mean, just how twisted, how messed up do you have to be uh, to do that? You know, and uh, I guess each limb cut in half to make eight parts, and then maybe the head makes nine, and then the middle section you cut into three. I mean, not to mess you up with what I'm thinking, but... <laughs> Um, there, there's options, you know, when you're thinking through it. Uh, as a side job, as some of you know, um, still won't forget the one of them that we've had to pick up and several different pieces from a motorcycle accident. You know, so it's it's crazy, you know, but it's kind of what this image comes to my mind. Anyways, at, at the at point of the, the section, you see they're being posted, FedExed, if you will, to the different tribes of Israel. Realistically, the Levite probably... Uh, asked other travelers to take parts um, of the body to deliver them to the head of the uh, 
each of the territories. Uh, and so when others saw the chopped up parts, um, I'm sure that the messengers explained how she was gang raped, uh, perhaps that caused her death. Uh, and maybe others thought that the group did the chopping as well. So that could have been part of the, the story. Um, Years later, uh, when King Saul, when he first became king, uh, he's going to do a very similar act, all except he does it with an oxen, not a person, you know, and he's, you know, trying to send a message throughout the nation of Israel, you know, ultimately to uh, who doesn't go out with Saul or Samuel uh, to battle, so shall be done like this oxen is the message he was sending to them. And you kind of wonder if Saul was getting his uh, uh, connection to what the Levite does here. He said, that's one for taking note of and, you know, for messing people up. But it's certainly something that got people's attention. It kind of reminds me of this story about this um, couple. And uh, they're going to bed one night and the wife told him that uh, he left the light on in the shed. And they can see it from the bedroom. And uh, as he looked, he saw that there are people taking things from the shed. And so he phoned the police, and uh, they said, oh, uh, no one's in the area at this time, so we're going to send someone over once they're available. So the guy says, okay, he hangs up. A minute later, he calls back. He says, hey, I just called you a minute ago <clears throat> because there's um, people in my shed. Well, you don't have to worry about them anymore because I shot them all. Within five minutes... Half a dozen police cars in the air, armed unit response to works. And, of course, they caught the burglars uh, red-handed. And so one of the officers said to him, I thought you said you shot them. And then the husband replied, well, I thought you said nobody's available. <laughs> so it's a way to get someone's attention. Anyways, so however it was messaged, you know, the parts to the, the Israelites, they got the message of her murder, and they were furious about it. And uh, notice that no one said anything about the gang that threatened him, uh, as, as well as the Levite sacrificing her, you know, through all this. So we mainly know at this point, this act ticked everyone off. And uh, now it becomes a call to arms to do something about it, as chapter 20 goes on to say. Then all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, from the land of Gilead, came together as one and assembled before the Lord in Mizpah. And the leaders of other people in the tribes of Israel took their places in the assembly of God's people, 400,000 men armed with swords. And the Benjamites heard the Israelites had gone up to Mizpah. And then the Israelites said, tell us how this awful thing happened. So here we're seeing that these tribes are gathering for war because of what happened back in chapter 19. And uh, we'll see what happened in answer to the question, tell us how this wicked deed happened. And notice that, uh, again, the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin is um, absent conspicuously. Uh, that's because the wicked deed happened in ben uh, the Benjamite territory. Verse 4, so the Levite. The husband of the murdered woman says, I and my concubine came to Gibeah and Benjamin to spend the night. During the night, the men of Gibeah came after me, surrounded the house, intended to kill me. They raped my concubine and she died. So the men of Gibeah were described as kind of perverted, uh, initially demanded the old man to lodge there while traveling uh, Levite. Uh, they sent him out so they could rape him. So again, the Levites really leaving keep parts of the story that really happened out, uh, even him giving uh, the um, concubine to this, this gang. Um, he didn't even admit that he slept through the night while she was being abused, because uh, that seems to be what was happening, uh, or that he planned on leaving her behind, except that she was at the doorstep, dead, unconscious, when he arose to leave. Uh, and so the children of Israel would, would still have been obliged to punish these um, perverted people in Gibeah. Uh, and they should have known the whole story uh, accurately without uh, the spin of the Levite on it. And that's the danger uh, when, when you only hear one side of the story. You know? And again, when he's also leaving out key parts of it. Uh, so we need to be very careful on giving advice or making judgments unless you know uh, or until you know the whole story. Um, so uh, it's important to, to get that information. Verse 6 goes on to say, I took my concubine, cut her into pieces, sent her uh, peace uh, into each region of Israel's inheritance because they committed this lewd and outrageous act in 
Israel. Kind of reminds you of those who've seen the Godfather movie um, when the Corleones received that package of uh, Luca's vest with dead fish, you know, and uh, Tereso who uh, explains this is a Sicilian message, you know, that Luca, you know, sleeps with the fishes, you know, just sending that message, he's dead. Anyways, uh, the Levite is sending such a message, you know, um, and again, this is just messed up. All that and all accounts that we've seen in how he's desecrated the body. I mean, who does that? You know, it, it should have been at least a, a cause for pause for those listening uh, and wonder what, what hasn't he told them yet. Verse 7. Now, all you Israelites, speak up and tell me what you have decided to do. All the men rose up together as one, saying, None of us will go home. No, not one of us will return to his house. But now this is what we'll do to Gibeah. We'll go up against it in order to decide by casting lots. Now, there are some commentators that, uh, who point out that they didn't seek the Lord first, uh, which is why they're going to be uh, initially met with uh, defeat in their uh, first couple battles. You know? And that could be the case. But it is also important to keep in mind and to realize that um, uh, no reason is given, uh, and therefore we need to be very careful in drawing conclusions about things that we're not told. Okay? Don't jump to conclusions, even though I, it makes sense in that way, but be careful there. God's law, again, was very clear regarding wickedness and crimes uh, these perverted men were guilty of. So they all deserve to be punished, whether you're seeking the Lord or not. That is what the law was demanding. And so the Israelites here are uh, compelled to act. And so uh, the, uh, they weren't requ you know, required in seeking the Lord. It was already very clear as day is what the, the word was telling them to do and to uh, discipline and to respond this way. Verse 10 goes and continues and says, We'll take ten men out of every hundred uh, from the tribes of Israel, a hundred from the thousands and a thousand from ten thousand, to get provisions for the army. Then the army arrives at Gibeah in Benjamin, and he can give them what they deserve for this outrageous act done in Israel. So these guys didn't take time to go home or to... Uh, get a, a good night's rest or attend uh, their business or any other thing uh, in their life. Uh, this was urgent. And uh, so they're reporting to duty. Uh, so the army here had no provisions, uh, uh, no, no problem. They were just breaking these guys up, and they're going to get supplies from either the tribes around or some of the local uh, towns or cities uh, not uh, too far uh, where they are at. And so uh, they're getting all the food for this large army. Verse 11, so all the Israelites got together uh, and united as one against the city. Now, one of the key points to keep in mind here is, is this, is that uh, they immediately reported for battle. And so whatever they had been doing, um, they, they were called out, they went, they left, they gathered together, whether they're farming, whether they're uh, building, whatever it is, you know, they just left it. Uh, the, the first and foremost, they were soldiers reporting to duty. As soon as you get the call, you go. And so the outcome of war has been settled, but there's also significant battles to fight. So again, uh, just like for us, we are victorious. We are overcomers, but we still have battles. Uh, some battles we win, some battles we lose. Um, reminded of the passage in Second uh, Timothy chapter 2, where Paul exhorts us, says, You therefore must endure hardship of a good as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one in engages the warfare, entangles himself with the affairs of this life, they may please him who listed him. So every time you get up and do your devotion, you are reporting for duty, if you will, you know, that we are in the Lord's army. We are here to get equipped and to get ready uh, to go out there and be a witness and to be effective for the Lord. Another point here is that expect to be victorious, but we might lose some battles, okay? So, and I say expect victory, it's because our enemies are fighting from a place of defeat. And so we are overcomers and more than conquerors, as the Bible tells us. And so we will lose some battles along the way. And, uh, and we'll see that in a moment. But we lose a battle, but God in his mercy and his forgiveness and compassion and comfort will see us through those things. You learn more through sometimes your losses when you're playing uh, a sport than, you know, just winning all the time. You know, sometimes that it teaches you some valuable lessons. Um, but again, you're not going to win every game. Uh, that's just not possible. Uh, you're not going to win every battle in life. 
Uh, verse 12 goes on to say, The tribes of Israel sent messengers throughout the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What about this awful crime that was committed among you? Now turn those wicked men of Gibeah over to us, that we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. So here these Israelites are trying to prevent an all-out war. So um, they're, they're telling the Benjamin, if you surrender these people, these bad guys, uh, to be tried, to be killed, you know, we're, we're going to go home and, and that will be that. You know, we're, we're trying to prevent this war. Well, verse, the rest of verse 13 continues, but the Benjamites uh, would not listen to their fellow Israelites. And so from their towns, they came together from Gibeah to fight against the Israelites. And once the Benjamites mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from their tribes, from their towns, and in addition to 700 able young men from those in, living in Gibeah, among those soldiers were 700 selected troops who were left-handed. Uh, each of them could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 swordsmen, all of them fit for battle. So the men of uh, the, the tribe of Benjamin respond by saying, in effect, hey, we'd rather go to war than to def and, to defend, and to defend our territory uh, than to give up those people. I mean, it's like, hello? You know, it's kind of foolishness, but uh, uh, the text doesn't say why. Uh, it could be fear of uh, what the survivors of the bad men would do to them. You know, that could be a possibility. Um, it could be due to the view that, hey, uh, they're our problem, and, and if we want to tolerate that lifestyle, who are you to lecture us and how to live? You know, so there is a thought there. Uh, and, and there could be simply the fact that they just wanted to defend uh, their part where they lived, and they didn't care what the issue was. So that could have been another thought in why they're doing this. And so, as you see here, they raised this army, about 26,000. And if you recall, the Israelites had an army of 400,000. So, um, you know, I, I don't know what you're, you're thinking besides this is our territory and we're going to defend it to death. That's probably the, the thought here. Uh, verse 16, as you see there, also says that there's 26,000. Kind of their secret weapon was the 700 left-handed people uh, who were experts in slingshots. And so I bet the Benjamites uh, thought they better, they had better weapons, they're more equipped. Uh, we can defeat this large army uh, with these trained men. Another thought kind of crossed my mind here is why did God um, want Israel to be divided into all these separate tribes? And again, part of it is just how he uh, spread out, get the tribes all over the, uh, the nations. If, if he knows all things, then why would there be fighting within Israel amongst the brethren as well? Why did he tolerate this? Well, it is easier to count and organize Israelites when they got divided up, when you look at how they're broken up and the numbers there. Uh, another reason, in the same way that siblings, brothers and sisters, uh, fight, it's kind of a reminder we have to get along with family despite our differences. So that's another thought here. And then another um, thought is that because God tolerated, he often allows our sin to play out as examples to others, uh, as a reason to say, here's what happens in the midst when you allow this to occur. So there's a lot of different possible uh, thoughts here, you know. So with all that said, let's continue. Verse 18, so the Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of the Lord. And they said, who is of... Who of us is first to go up to fight against the Benjamites? And the Lord replied, Judah shall go up first. So their cause was right. They consulted the Lord, and there was this high expectation of victory. But the next morning, verse 19, the Israelites got up, pitched the tent near Gibeah. And the Israelites went out to fight the Benjamites and took battle positions against them at Gibeah. The Benjamites came out of Gibeon and cut down 22,000 Israelite sons uh, the battlefield that day. So you're almost thinking, that we didn't see this one coming. You know, you, you think they'd be wiped out. Uh, but this is where a lot of you know, commentators have different views and have problems sometimes as they start suggesting all sorts of reasons why the Israelites were defeated. Uh, one is that God is punishing them for their sins. Maybe he was. We're not told here. Uh, and, and those who suggest see no possibility of defeat uh, so long as you're right with the Lord. Um, 
and, and I think just the, the bare facts do minister to us that sometimes right cause, uh, rightly approached by a righteous believer, um, is um, defeated in spiritual warfare. So it can happen. You know, you can do all the right things and everything's doing, you know, by the book, if you will, and you can still suffer defeat. That can happen. You know, the example of the Apostle Paul, uh, he desired to uh, revisit the, the believers in Thessalonica, and he was physically prevented from going there by the enemy, you know, um, who, who said to block the way, if you will. So he had the right heart, right mentality, you know, to go and do that, but then he was hindered, you know, didn't, didn't happen. Uh, verse 22 goes on to say, But the Israelites encouraged one another and again took up their provisions where they had stationed themselves on the first day. The Israelites went up and wept before the Lord until evening. They inquired of the Lord and they said, we, Shall we go up again and fight the battles of, uh, against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites? And the Lord answers, Go up against them. And the Israelites drew near to Benjamin the second day. This time, when the Benjamites came out from Gibeah to oppose them, they cut down another 18,000 Israelites, all of them armed with swords. So you can see these Benjamites are pretty fierce. You know, They're not to be messed with. And again, the Israelites didn't think that this was going to happen. Then all the Israelites, verse 26, the whole army went up to Bethel where they sat and weeping before the Lord. And they fasted until the evening and presented a burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was there and Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. And they asked, shall we go up again and fight against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites or not? And the Lord responded, go for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. So there's certainly a different tone this time. So here's the second time. They've been wiped out two, two other times. The Israelites are humbled now. And it affected themselves so much that they're now fasting. And then they made these burnt offerings for their sin. They followed that with a peace offering, which is then uh, worship and fellowship with the Lord. So they were renewing, they were reaffirming and celebrating the covenant with the Lord. And it appears they kind of have a, a bit of a change of heart, uh, what is happening among the other tribes. Um, you know, they were there to really correct the, um, the, the men of Gibeah, but the Lord used the situation to correct them instead. And that's what the Lord will do so many times in our life. You know, we think we're going to go do that, but yet God reverses it and corrects us and deals with us. So we see how they fasted. They truly sought after the Lord, offer a sacrifice. Uh, they dealt with their sin, made peace with God. And, and here's the thought is that how can anyone go to war uh, in the name of God without first being at peace with him? You know, you got to be at peace with the Lord. You got to be in that right space with the Lord. And as we see here with the narrator, he uh, intrudes directly into the story a few important uh, details of the Ark of the Covenant and the name of the high priest Phineas. So the focus upon the Ark of the Covenant is vital uh, in the, really the fullest sense of the, the word uh, because the Ark represents God's covenant commitments to Israel as well as theirs to the Lord and to each other. So as we know how God is so gracious... And, and he responds them to a new way um, that the Israelites inquire about, again, going out to battle. And again, the Lord responded, go tomorrow, I'm going to give them into your hands. Verse 29 continues, then Israelites set an ambush around Gibeah, went against the Benjamites on the third day, and took positions against Gibeah that they had done before. Benjamite came out to meet them, and they were drawn away from the cities, and, and began to inflict casualties on the Israelites as before. So about... 30 men fell in the opening field on the roads, and one leading to Bethel and the other to Gibeah. While the Benjamites were saying, we are defeating them as before. The Israelites were saying, let's retreat and draw them away from the city to the roads. And all the men of Israel moved from their places and took up positions from Baal Temar. And the Israelite ambush charged out of its uh, place on the west of Gibeah. Then 10,000 of the Israelites' young men made a frontal attack on Gibeah, and the fight was so heavy the Benjamites didn't realize how near 
disaster was. So the Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel. And that day, Israel struck down 25,100 Benjamites, all armed with swords. So now they were victorious because they finally discovered uh, the Lord's strategy. That is a possibility here. We're not told about that strategy came from the Lord. Uh, we just see how it's all playing out here. All that is recording coming from the Lord is that he's going to grant them victory the third time. And the things that we would suggest explains that their initial defeats and eventual victory uh, reveals uh, what they believe about the Lord. And again, uh, if we exclude the possibility of defeat, uh, then we'll be even more defeated thinking that God was against us as well. But sometimes there's just lessons that have to be learned uh, through this process. Verse 36 continues, Then the Benjamites saw that they were beaten. Now the men of Israel had given away before Benjamin because they relied on the ambush that they had set near Gibeah. And those who had been in ambush made a sudden dash unto Gibeah, spread out and put the whole city to the sword. And so the Israelites had arranged with the ambush that they send up a great cloud of smoke from the city and the Israelites would counter attack. And the Benjamites had begun to inflict casualty on the Israelites, about 30. And they said, we are defeating them as in the first battle. So, as we said, even in victory, there's going to be casualties. So 30 men died, making Benjamin uh, think that they're once again going to prevail uh, to, you know, to deal with this ambush. And, um, and, and this is kind of in a similar way. You know, you and I uh, will always emerge from uh, spiritual battles unscathed. We're not going to always be that way. You're going to get bruised. You're going to get cuts. You know, there's going to be some, you know, difficulties along the way. Now notice what happens in verse 40. But when the column of smoke began to rise from the city, the Benjamites turned and saw the whole city going up in smoke. Then the Israelites countered attack and the Benjamites were terrified because they realized disaster had come from. So they fled from the Israelites that they, in the direction of the wilderness that they not escaped the battle. And the Israelites who came out of the towns cut them down there. They surrounded the Benjamites, chased them, easily overround them into the vicinity of Gibeah on the east. 18,000 Benjamites fell of, the, uh, of them, violent fighters. And as they turned and fled toward the wilderness of the Rock of Remon, uh, the Israelites cut down 5,000 men among the roads. They kept pressing after the Benjamites as far as Gidim and struck down two more thousand. And then on the day, 25,000 <clears throat> Benjamite swordsmen fell, all of them valiant fighters. But 600 of them turned and fled into the wilderness to the Rock Remon, uh, where they stayed there four months. And the men of Israel went back to Benjamin to pull... Uh, put all the towns to sword, including the animals and every else uh, they found. And all the towns that they came across, they set on fire. So here you see how the Israelites were victorious at last, uh, even kind of bittersweet, but it was victory over their own brothers, their own tribes, you know, within the family of Israel. And so they nearly eliminated this entire tribe creating a problem that we're going to see trying to solve in chapter 21. So the defeat uh, is only temporary. And same thing in our lives. You know, when we're defeated, it's only temporary. Uh, Jesus has granted us and given us the ultimate victory that we all have. So these Israelites thought they, they, they suffered defeat. Um, like them, you know, we got to return to battle. They returned. They kept fighting. They didn't quit. Um, and so we got to keep pressing on and uh, seeking the Lord. Uh, keep serving Him, you know, reporting for duty. Now, chapter 21. The men of Israel had taken an oath at uh, Mizpah. Not one of us will give his daughter into marriage to a Benjamite. So again, we see another foolish vow. We saw one back in chapter 11 with Jephthah, where he says he's coming back from battle, says, whatever comes out of my house, I'm going to sacrifice and end up being his daughter. You know, one of those foolish, rash vows. And again, the Bible never commands us to make an oath. Uh, if we do, we better keep it. And uh, their oath uh, is they're not going to give any of the uh, 600 remaining Benjamite uh, their daughters in marriage. And thus the tribe of Benjamin uh, will eventually fade off uh, the scene. And so in a sense, their death sentence. 
Um, it, it wasn't necessary, uh, and it certainly wasn't part of God's law. Uh, it was that rash, unbiblical, uncalled for, showing extra spirituality in that sense. It's kind of like what legalism is all about. Legalism and action here. Uh, they impose a man-made law upon themselves and upon others, and then elevated the outward observance of the status to the, <clears throat> the law of God. And again, as a kind of a quick, accurate definition of legalism uh, in, in Christianity legalism is the excessive improper use of God's law imposing of man's laws uh, made equally binding uh, so the term really uh, to describe more so the doctrinal positions emphasizing a system of rules and regulations for achieving both salvation and spiritual growth and so Legalists usually believe in and demand strict, literal adherence to the rules and regulations. Uh, there's no spirit there. There's no love. There's no joy. It's just legalism. So getting back to our story here, verse 2 goes on to say, The people went to Bethel, and they sat before God until evening, raising their voices and weeping bitterly. Uh, Lord, God of Israel, they cried, Why has this happened to Israel? Why should one tribe be missing from Israel today? So why has this thing come to pass? Uh, because they were letting their mission, what they're doing, and you know, uh, to, to punish the wicked men of Gibeah to get out of control. It didn't have to come to this. And, and in reality, it comes into view as they realize what they've done. Now the light comes on. You know, they'd won the battle... Um, but but here's the situation here. The, the, this victory is really empty. It wasn't really much of a victory. You know, you're, you're battling against your old brothers. And so the tribe of Benjamin had only 600 men left. Uh, and now because of this vow, they would be unable to marry uh, from women from Israel. And thus Benjamin would be no more. So that's kind of what's sinking into their minds right now. Early the next day, the people built an altar and presented burnt offering and fellowship offerings. And when they, then the Israelites asked, From whom all the tribes of Israel has failed to assemble before the Lord? For they had taken into the solemn oath that anyone who failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah was to be put to death. Now the Israelites grieved for the tribe of Benjamin, their fellow Israelites. Today one tribe is cut off from Israel, they said. How can we provide wives for those who are left, since we have taken an oath by the Lord and not given them any of our daughters in marriage? And then they asked, which one of these tribes of Israel failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah? And they discovered that uh, no one from the um, Jebush Gilead had come uh, to the camp for the assembly. So when they counted the people, they found that none of the people from Jebush Gilead were there. So... There's no really reason uh, for their absence uh, of the men coming from Jebesh Gilead. Uh, for all they knew, they could have just been an oversight. They didn't get the memo. Um, or perhaps uh, fueled by uh, legalistic spirit, the men of Israel um, were intending to keep the rash vows above everyone else. Um, verse 10 goes on to say, So the assembly uh, sent 12,000 men, instructions to go to Jebesh Gilead, and put the sword to those living there including the women and children. And this is what you're to do. Kill every male, every woman who is not a virgin. So you can see how their legalism kept making things worse. Uh, not only did they commit further atrocities, they felt justifying in doing it. And so we might describe them uh, keeping the letter of the law while ignoring the spirit of the law. So even the men of Jebesh Gilead outright refused to join the war against the Benjamites. And the appropriate punishment wasn't mass murder. You know, but this is what they're doing. And in fact, the Israelites were using the second vow uh, to their advantage as an excuse to um, the solution to the problem. Verse 12 goes on to say, They found among the people living in Jebesh Gilead 400 young women who had never slept with a man, and they took them into the camp of Shiloh in Canaan. So their, their vow, as recorded back in verse 5, seemed to confine um, to the fighting men who refused to join uh, fighting against the Benjamites. They altered it uh, to include everyone except the, um, the young virgins, uh, whom they needed to solve the problem uh, created a whole uh, by this other vow. And this is the way legalists operate. They, they always change the rules to fit their situation. Uh, 
And uh, so the, 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 their list always benefits them while uh, projecting restraints on others. So in other words, it's all subjective. And uh, it's all man-made. And so the custom tailored uh, to benefit the person. Verse 13, so the whole assembly sent an offer of peace to the Benjamites at the Rock of Rimmon. So the Benjamites returned at the time when they were given women at Jebesh Gilead who had been spared, but there were not enough for all of them. Now, in thinking about the scene from the view of the surviving Benjamites, uh, so they probably lost a lot of their family members, um, friends in this war, um, and um, and so the enemy gives them kind of this consolation prize, uh, new brides that are not a part of their tribe. My guess is that neither man or woman uh, that were in the best of mood after all this happened, uh, all, all the young girls lost their families as well, as we see how they're uh, clearing out this. I'm sure it certainly took a long time for everyone to accept the situation. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of anger uh, in, in this situation as well. And so the people grieved for Benjamin because the Lord had made a gap in the tribes of Israel. So people are always looking for loopholes. Israel was no exception. They're always trying to find a loophole uh, to, to find the situation. So they had a, a partial solution um, to this problem. The question is, is God happy with this? Uh, is God smiling down on what they're doing? Uh, do they think they're serving God by their actions? Uh, and how mixed up and messed up are they? You know, So it's amazing how easy they, they forget the wickedness of the men of uh, Benjamin. And, and they wipe out almost the entire tribe in battle. And they say, hey, let's just forget it, what, what just happened. You know, just, let's just not worry about it. You know, let's just move on. Uh, but again, there's a lot of hurt and a lot of pain uh, that's gone on. The men of uh, Benjamin didn't repent of their actions, and yet Israel was uh, willing to forget what has happened. And it's amazing how easily they were guided by their emotions. And we see, still see there's 200 uh, of the Benjamin uh, men still needing wives. And those, another solution needs to be drawn up. So the elders of the assembly, verse 16, with the women of Benjamin destroyed, how shall we provide wives for the men who are left? Quite amazing because they never asked the Lord, you know, what shall we do? You know, so they're coming up with their own solutions versus letting the Lord do what he needs to do or what he could do. Verse 17, the Benjamite survivors must have, uh, have heirs, they said, so that the tribe of Israel will not be wiped out. We cannot give them our daughters as wives, since the Israelites have taken uh, this oath. Uh, cursed be anyone who gives a wife to Benjamin. But look, there is an annual feast of the Lord in Shiloh that uh, lies north of Bethel, the east road that goes from Bethel to Shechem and south to Libnath. So as we see here, the, the tribe of Benjamin must be preserved. And it was necessary, therefore, that they should take the steps to uh, try to you know, find wives for them. Uh, other tribes couldn't give them the daughters, as we've uh, already covered, uh, and on the account of the oath that has already been mentioned. And consequently, um, there, there's hardly any other course open than uh, uh, to let the Benjamites seize the wives upon themselves. And so these elders here um, lend them a helping hand by offering them some advice uh, that the next festival at Shiloh, when all these people are coming up, at which the daughters at Shiloh um, carry on these dances in the open air in the uh, outside of town. So this is what they're thinking. So they instructed, verse 20, uh, the Benjamites saying, Go and hide in the vineyards and watch. And when the young women of Shiloh come out to join the dancing, rush from the vineyards, and each of you sees one of them to be your wife. And then they return to the land of Benjamin. And when their fathers or brothers complain to us, we will say to them, do us the favor of helping them. Because we did not get wives for them during the war, you will not be guilty of breaking your oath because you did not give your daughters to them. So here's where they're justifying their sins section comes in. 
So when their families complain about the daughters being kidnapped for marriage, because that's what's happening here, uh, we'll just say it, it's, it was all our fault because we didn't provide the wives uh, due to our vows. So these verses also tell us that the families of the girls uh, are not in the kidnapping plan until after it occurs. They, you know, here's, here's the idea. You know, And so they get the, the details on how it occurred. The Benjamites uh, didn't have wives that were told... Uh, Go hide in the vineyards. So when the girls were dancing, uh, they were to jump out and get them for themselves. It's one way to pick a bride, you know. Uh, order, click, send. <laughs> um, but how can you see the, the couples fighting later on in their marriage? You know, hey, I picked you out. I can throw you away. You know, they didn't have a very happy marriage. You know, possibly. You know, so you can see all kinds of um, scenarios with these uh, sort of relationships. But in short, it's another example of a failure to live as God desires that we live and and watching how the consequences play out. So if we get anything out of this lesson, it's the idea that we uh, there's long term consequences for living, um, failing to live the way God desires. You know, so these are some of the lessons you learn throughout the whole book. Let's continue. Verse 23. So that's what the Benjamites did while the young men were dancing, women dancing. Each man uh, caught one, carried her off to be his wife, and then they returned to her inheritance and rebuilt the towns and settled them in them. And at the time, the Israelites left the place and went home to their tribes and the clans, each of his own inheritance. So um, the actual kidnapping in this epilogue here uh, of these stories, the Benjamins um, back in their territory where they lived um, and Remember, most of their towns, again, got wiped out by the war. And therefore, they had to rebuild uh, where their towns, where they lived, uh, what the wives were giving them to recapture, you know, uh, from, from the kidnapping. Now, here's the strange part. Not only how the story ends, but it's how the book of Judges ends. Um, it it kind of, you know, it sort of leaves us hanging, asking, why didn't God step in? You know, or, or why did he allow all this horrid stuff uh, to occur? Why end the book this way? Uh, in effect, uh, the answer is really in the final verse there, in verse 25. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone uh, did as they saw fit. So everyone goes back to their homes as if nothing happened. So life just continues on in the midst of all this immorality uh, that is all around them. And, and it's, a, it's a reason, again, for their failure. Uh, in the case you've missed it, the Lord uh, was no longer on the throne uh, or important to them. Uh, so he wasn't reigning on the thrones of their heart. Uh, and thus they were doing whatever they felt right is in their own eyes. And that's what we started with, uh, you know, 17 weeks ago when we started the, the book of Judges. And you see all the murder, you see all the immorality, you see uh, the idolatry, child sacrifice, civil war, stealing. You get the picture. You know, everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. Uh, that which is right is wrong and what is wrong is right is what they're thinking. So as we conclude this book, you wonder what good can come out of this, uh, of this period of time. It's so dark and so ugly, and yet the very next book will come to, the book of Ruth. Um, it, uh, it's a light that shines in a darkness, and it's, uh, it's hope uh, when everything else is falling apart. And it tells me that no matter how bad things look, that God is working there and is there to those who love him and those who serve him and those who have the Lord on the thrones of their heart. And that's what we're going to look at uh, when we get to the book of Ruth. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this amazing and crazy book of Judges, Lord. There's so much in this that we've learned over these uh, several months. We pray, Lord, that we be doers of your word and not just hearers only, the lessons, the warnings uh, that you've spoken to us about. And we see the tragedy that goes on when people abandon you and uh, live a lifestyle uh, to glorify them fl- their, their flesh. And so I pray that we'd be walking in your spirit, that we'd uh, be sensitive to your voice, that we'd have a hunger and thirst for your word and for righteousness and a hatred for evil. So we thank you for this time that we can gather together to draw close to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.